So good morning, good afternoon, bon dia, bo tarde uh, to, to all of you in the second day of the webinar on intergovernmental cooperation in multilevel systems organized by the Institute of Applied Economic Research and the Forum of Federations with the support of CEPAL. The objective of the webinar is to increase understanding among Brazilian practitioners and researchers of intergovernmental collaboration in other jurisdictions to help inform the development of Brazil's own processes with a focus on public consortia. Today, experts from South Africa, Germany, Mexico, and Colombia will share insights into the dynamics of the intergovernmental cooperation regimes within their respective countries. We are very privileged to be joined by an esteemed panel of experts from these countries. Uh, before we begin, please give me, uh, let me give you a couple of instructions um, uh, to assure a smooth development of our webinar. We would kindly ask you to mute your microphones when you are not speaking. When you are speaking, so when you participate in the discussion, and if possible, of course, please turn your uh, cameras on so that you can address the panel directly. And finally, this web is being recorded and following the event, the archived video will be posted on both the web, the Forum of Federations and IPL websites. For the benefit of our international panel, which is uh, different to yesterday, and uh, also those who were not able to join us yesterday, we will repeat the introductory uh, section of, of, of the program and the presentation is on uh, intergovernment relations in Brazil and also on public consortia. Uh, now we can now proceed with the uh, event uh, welcoming remarks. And uh, so our first speaker here was uh, uh, President and CEO of the Forum of Federations, Mr. Rupak Chatopadie, who are unfortunately uh, isn't able to, to join us this morning. So uh, I'll just say a few, few words on his behalf. Um, so uh, let me again welcome our, everybody uh, this morning, our moderator in its Slack our esteemed panel, panelists and also participants. And just say that we very much value our long-standing partnership with IPEA and um, hope that this, hope that this uh, joint activity will be a useful exchange of experiences on the theme of intergovernmental cooperation practices in the featured countries and Brazil. And we all, of course, look forward to our future collaboration in the future. Um, let me now uh, welcome um, to the webinar uh, the, uh, Mr. Uh, José Eduardo Malta Brandão, uh, Deputy Director of the Department of International Studies, Political and Economic Relations of the Institute of uh, Applied Economic Research, uh, who will provide um, uh, introductory remarks, welcoming remarks on um, of, of, on. on for, for IPEA, and also Ambassador Miguel Griesbach de Pereira Franco, uh, Special Advisor to the Secretary of Government of the Presidency of Brazil and former Federation's Board Member for Brazil, uh, who will provide uh, opening remarks. So thank you very much again, and um, Mr. Brandau, please, um, your floor is yours. Good morning and good afternoon. How will you brief? Unfortunately, uh, President Carlos von Dollinger cannot be present today. On his behalf, I would like to welcome you all to the second day of our seminar. Today, we will discuss the experience and the key aspects for the success of the failure of the intergovernmental cooperation regimes in our countries. Uh, this is very important for the construction of the uh, public policies because we can learn from the experience for, of uh, other countries, learning best practices and uh, avoiding the same mistakes. I will wish you all a great seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ambassador um, Miguel Franco, por favor. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I would like first to, to thank you for the valuable opportunity yesterday to learn some aspects of public consortia in, in very relevant countries from the, the Brazilian perspective. And it is welcoming words uh, to the participant of this second day of seminar. 
Uh, I would like to recall what Mr. Fernando Rezende said yesterday regarding multiple circumstances related to the different types of intergovernmental cooperation on federalist states. May I also recall the words of Mr. Constantino about the importance of public consortia for coordinating management efforts to provide certain services efficiently and at, a lowest, at the lowest possible cost. In this context, it's worth stressing the value of the platform being developed by IKEA, bringing together the various sources of information currently available in Brazil. Based on what has been said yesterday, from the perspective of the Secretariat of Government, it's worth also uh, seizing the opportunity of this seminar to present some instances of our political dialogue with representative entities, such as National Front Mayors, which bring together 412 of the largest Brazilian municipalities with more than 80,000 inhabitants in total. The coordination with this instant, instance is particularly useful for us because it offers a comprehensive view of how the main themes of municipal man management are being addressed in all 26 capitals, which are home of 61% of the inhabitants and 74% of the country gross domestic product. Based on the information received, the Secretary of Government forwards the demands of respective ministries and monitors the measures taken at this instance of central government. For a country like Brazil, with uh, 5,568 municipalities, it is of fundamental importance to dialogue with these bodies such as the National Confederation of Municipalities, and even more specific entities, such as the Associations of Municipalities, which offer us the possibility of identifying regional demands in sectors, such as health, urban mobility, and sanitation, and other topics that are subject to public consortia in Brazil, as mentioned yesterday. The validity of the sphere of, of dialogue in practical terms is offered by the recent meetings such as the one that was recently held with representatives of the Association no, no, no. of no, no. Municipalities of the Archipelago of Marajó, the so-called AMAM, AMAM, which represents 14 Marajoara municipalities around specific initiatives, such as the embrace of the Marajó program, bringing together 109 specific actions to be implemented over the next three years. The relevance of this program is expressed by the challenging of the developed an area from the main, far from the main urban centers with around 550,000 inhabitants spread over 2,500 islands and islets in a region with one of the lowest human, develop, uh, human development indexes in Brazil. For the execution of programs like this, which should have resources of nearly $2 billion, it is essential that mayors and managers across the country be trained in the administrations of resources transferred by the union. The so-called Participa Mais Brasil portal already available for access on the internet, offers hand, handouts to guide mayors and managers in addressing the main issues in their municipalities. On an additional basis, in the second half of this, this year, the Secretariat of Government will offer a specific course for mayors with classes in audiovisual and written format with a workload of 120 hours in the distance mode. From the objective of guiding the measures associated with fulfillment of the government plan, 
suggestions for actions, action lines will be offered based on indicators of the situation and goals associated with the multi-year plan, the so-called PPA in Brazil. These are some of the instruments that the Secretary of, of Government has used in favor of integrated treatment of government action, capable of strengthening the productive base and expanding the supply of quality public services for the last developer region in the country. I, will, I would also like to stress the value of the contributions today for countries like Colombia and South Africa. So as I said yesterday, we are all learning. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Franco, for your uh, remarks. Um, let me now introduce to you our moderator, Professor Init Slack, who will guide us through the next couple of hours. Mm -hmm. Init is the director of Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. Init has been working on municipal finance issues for 40 years and has been retained by agencies such as World Bank, uh, IMF, International Growth Center, UN Habitat, Asian Development Bank, and Inter-American Development Bank in countries such as Brazil, China, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, Mongolia, the Philippines, and South Africa. She has written several books and articles on property taxes, intergovernmental transfers, development charges, municipal infrastructure finance, and metropolitan governance. In it, Thank you very much for joining us today, and um, please take it, uh, take it away. Thank you, uh, Diana, and good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be back for the second day of this webinar uh, to moderate uh, this discussion on intergovernmental cooperation in multi-level systems. Uh, the purpose of today's webinar is to look at experiences in four different countries uh, than yesterday. Uh, today we're looking at South Africa, Germany, Mexico, and Colombia. And we're going to try and see what works and what doesn't work, and most importantly, uh, why do they work or not. Uh, our goal here, as we heard, is to help inform the development of intergovernmental processes in Brazil. So let me just run through the format of the, uh, of the uh, event for you. Uh, first, we're going to hear from two Brazilian experts about intergovernmental relations in Brazil to give us some context uh, for what we're looking at. Their presentations will then be followed by a moderated discussion with four panelists. I will ask each of the panelists two questions, and then we'll have time to go to open discussion with the audience so that you can ask questions of any of the panelists. Uh, there will be a five minute break. It is a two and a half hour session, so there will be a five minute break uh, part way through. So let me introduce our two Brazilian speakers to you. Uh, Fernando Resende is a consultant to private and public institutions in the area of public finance, tax reforms, and fiscal federalism. He is a former president of the Institute of Applied Economic Research and Professor of Public Finance and Fiscal Policy at the Getulio Vargas Foundation in Rio and Brasilia. He is an economist who holds a master's degree from Vanderbilt University. And our second speaker from Brazil is Constantino Cronenberger Mendes. He is a researcher at the Institute of Applied Economic Research, director of the Foreign Federation's Brazil office. He holds a doctorate in public sector economics from the University of Brasilia. Thank you, Enid, and everyone who is here participating in this webinar. And I just want to, I don't have much time. So I just want two key points that to me are very important for us to look at um, addressing problems that Brazil face in this area of achieving a better result in terms of uh, intergovernmental relations. The first is that we don't really have anymore a fiscal equalization regime, which I think is a very important uh, instrument for addressing intergovernmental relations in different areas of public policy. The one we had in the mid-60s and mid-70s were 
put aside one year after the new constitution was enacted in 1988, which means the following. For more than 30 years, that is three decades, the coefficients of trans that transfer federal funds to states and municipalities were frozen or is frozen. So that means that uh, that led to a high degree of horizontal inequalities, especially among municipalities, because at the same time, changes in the constitution also uh, allow, allowed for the multiplication of very small municipalities in Brazil. Just to, to, to mention an example, more than 70% of the municipalities in Brazil have less than 20,000 inhabitants. And that amid a high degree, oh, high degree is not the correct word, amid a, a fast, perhaps one of the fast in the world, degree of urbanization in Brazil, with the concentration of a great majority of poor people in huge metropolitan areas. So that is a very big problem that we have to deal with. And uh, one problem is that we have to put in place a new fiscal equalization regime as fast as possible. The second problem is that at the same time that we destroyed the fiscal equalization regime, uh, we allowed, uh, the constitution gave uh, political autonomy to municipalities. That led to a, a problem to make it very much difficult for the states to organize uh, fiscal uh, uh, intergovernmental relations within the limits of their jurisdictions. So, so uh, there is a, very often a conflict among uh, states and uh, local governments because we had also applied a mid-term elections in Brazil, but it's not the same as the United States because it's a mid-term elections that uh, occur between national and elections for the state governments. So, uh, so at, by each two years, by change, the uh, political leaders that are in, uh, in a, in it, within each state in their municipalities. And that is also a problem that you have to look at very carefully uh, in trying to move ahead in the direction of improving the work of intergovernmental relations in Brazil. And as Constantino will mention uh, just after me, uh, we, we have had at, until today good information to evaluate the results in the outcomes of the fiscal equalization of the body of the intergovernmental relations schemes that have been put in place in the last 20 years for this. That's two points that I think we can learn a lot in the discussion of this uh, seminar from different experience of multi-level governments. And I'm really waiting very eager to get this experience and to hear what uh, participants in this event will have to say. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fernando. I think that's a really important context for the discussion to, you know, the notion of local autonomy uh, being so important, but at the same time, uh, when there is local autonomy, people do for different things. And if there's no fiscal equalization, uh, that, then you're going to have some municipalities that can do lots and others that can't, and, and there's no way to ensure that they can even provide comparable services at comparable tax rates. So a very important context for us. Thank you. Uh, Constantino. Thank you, Nils. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. We will speak in Portuguese so to pay the Brazilian interpreter. Uh, so I will talk about public consortia. 
with federal and this is a project from IPEA with the help of CEPAL treating talking about intergovernmental cooperation the objective of this project is to make a diagnostic of this mechanism of federalist cooperation and we see one major problem which is to show the legal and political formalization of the legal entity and the viability and the results of the interfederational arrangements. The second objective is to identify and characterize these mechanisms of change of public policies. And finally, it is to gather international experience in this multi-level intergovernmental cooperation. Speaking of Brazil, these legal marks that we are going to talk about with accountability and public actions in the execution of public policies of public interest, first of all, a part of an amendment to the Constitution number 19 from 1998 transformed into the Article 241 of the Brazilian Constitution says that the Union, states and municipalities will have access to these consortia and which are associated to public interest. This was made by a law in 2005 and with the decree from 2007. It was the first law to hire these public consortia to this shared responsibility of the public and to identify these public policies, for example, in healthcare and the statute of the metropolises. The public consortia involves some aspects. The first one is the political aspects because it's a voluntary deal. The second one is the institutional aspect, which integrates and finally the territorial aspect, which is very that reflects importantly in terms of the regional development. I'm going to give you a few examples and sources that are based, uh, that will be based for information. These are public access information and then on the website of this information they have a specific characteristics that are limiting within specific period of time and years and uh, they some are updated the dynamic some are yearly other every four months uh, who provides the information either the municipality or the consortia and the headquarters of the municipality of headquarter the identification of the cooperating entities be it with the municipal level or the federal government and the areas of acting or uh, of, of each area the first one is the national registry of illegal entities that is responsible for in the brazilian internal revenue service we identified three over three thousand a, a registries that are compatible with the consor the public consortia and uh, 
1,911 are active consortia with uh, date 2020-20 and 61 go beyond the criteria the National Registry of Legal Entity involving uh, names and other characteristics of the consortia. Another database that is very important in Brazil is the one in IBGE, in Portuguese IBGE. They are municipal data that uh, out of the 5,570 municipalities in Brazil, 75% say they belong to one type of public consortium in 2019. Over 3,000 said that they were part between inter municipal consortia. 532 had consortia with between states, and 29 municipalities say that they have consortia with the federal government. That is interesting because formally the federal government participates or participated. Uh, only in one public consortia, the public, the public authority of the Olympics in 2016. And the federal government is only a part of the public consortium when there is a participation of the federal entities or the states. And Monique, the name of this database, also shows the areas in which the consortia are, healthcare, social development, tourism, culture, um, environment and other de urban development, uh, basic sanitation, water management, and management of waste solid residue. We created an analytic treatment in our work group and we identified with the municipal information one over 1,200 consortia that are registered as, as legal entities. And the main area for the research, for the the survey in 2019, 310 consortia involved, were involved in healthcare and uh, multiple consortia with different areas in that had, we had, there were 99. In the other platform, the ambassador has already mentioned, Mais Brasil, in English more Brazil, that deals with the partnerships and the partnerships between the federal government in which the federal government will provide the financial resources. This system is a registry between of partnerships between the consortia and the consortium and the federal government. So it's a sample of the previous databases. And we have 195 consortia out of the, this 195, 179 or 92% have a partnership with the federal government or 174 have at least one proposal for the federal government. Out of the 179 consortia that are partner that have partnership, 80% have payments for public service that are executed by this federal by uh, provided by the federal resources. One example is the the consortia CIDES, uh, that is uh, Sustainable Development in the State of Minas Gerais. And there are eight municipalities that are cons in a consortium and uh, with partnership with the federal government. And 75% of the resources from the federal government are concentrated in three municipalities alone. This political analysis can also be done by of this arrangement starting with a system of information by the Supreme Electoral Court that in which you can understand the political dynamic of this consortium. Summarizing, I would like to say that the work bit of compatibility between these two different sources involves 3,083 public consortia that are registered formally in the country and 3,046 are at the basis of the, in the database of the Internal Federal Re Revenue Service in Brazil. Uh, 336 are in the database of the federal government and uh, over a thousand in the IBG database. But only 
unfortunately only 290 are simultaneously in the three databases which shows a, strong, a big problem of compatibility between these databases. The first conclusion we can draw is that we can answer our uh, question, our critic, initial critic that shows internal consistencies and incompatibility between these information sources that are results of and that that limits the diagnosis of the results of the consortium and on the other hand it shows the importance of the projects in which we're involved including a technical note that will be created in the next few weeks the second conclusion is shows the integration of the database which is the national database of legal entity and be complemented by other attributes if, such as uh, other uh, legal nature or other characteristics and the third conclusion it sh shows the specificity of the Brazilian federal aspect in terms of the autonomy of the federal entities especially the municipalities and the relations between the political entity one that at some times it they cooperate and some compete and the political agreements that are stable and certain in legal security that uh, bring some negative effects on uh, for future or potential partnerships public private partnerships and something else is the passive government of the state and, uh, and the role of the state and the federal and the state government regarding the creation of public consortia and the, and the sharing of the roles and the resources and in defining the targets and goals for uh, in these coordinated actions. The potential at the same time can be seen of the consortia as an instrument for federal coordination and the public services that can be provided and considering economies of scale, for example, the reduction of the transaction cost and the sharing of uh, public services and the equipment of the federal entities. And at last, the importance of this seminar in comparing the international experiences that are similar or alternative as an instrument of uh, intergovernmental cooperation for a more public, effective and efficient action, public action. Thank you. Thanks very much, Constantino. Um, I, I enjoyed your presentation. I got even more out of it today than yesterday. Uh, there's so much information in there. And uh, the, these public consortia in Brazil are, are really interesting because they're much more formal mechanisms for intergovernmental cooperation than we see in other parts of the world. And I was struck by a couple of things. You said 75% of municipalities belong to a public consortium and some involve the state and federal governments as well but but most municipalities um, are involved and they cover so many different areas health social development tourism culture environment water waste uh, a lot of them health i know uh, but but they're a really important mechanism for intergovernmental cooperation in brazil and uh, um, and very interesting to, to the rest of us um, so uh, Fernando and Constantino um, talked a little bit about what they talked about yesterday and now it's my role to, to tell you what everybody else said in, in five minutes. Um, so yesterday we heard from four countries, Switzerland, India, Argentina and Canada, and we heard about cooperation mainly among federal and provincial governments, but also a little bit about local governments. I hope today we'll talk a little bit more about local governments. Um, and, and there were sort of three areas that we covered. Um, firstly, Fernando Resende started by telling us that there's no one model of intergovernmental cooperation that will work everywhere. History and context matter. And our, panels, our panelists all confirmed that conclusion by telling us what mattered in their respective countries. And here's a list of six things that they talked about and different countries talked about different things. Um, the first thing was the extent of local autonomy in the country. That was especially important in Switzerland, where local autonomy is so important and the federal government doesn't get involved very often in local matters. Uh, the second contextual piece was the division of powers in the Constitution. And that was mentioned in Canada and India, for example. What, what are the roles of the different governments as set out in the Constitution? That will affect cooperation. The third was the role of political parties. 
what party is in power at each level of government? And that was mentioned especially in India, but also in Argentina, uh, where federal provincial relations, we were told, are determined by whether the same party is in power at the federal level and at the provincial level. So obviously, if it's the same party, that may be more operation than if there are different parties. We also talked about conflict between national and local interests. That was mentioned in Argentina. Uh, the presence of an independent judiciary was mentioned in India as being an important part of intergovernmental relations. And lastly, everybody talked about the personalities of the politicians and officials at each level of government. Some people just make cooperation work. Um, others are less interested in it. And the panelists also talked about the evolving nature of intergovernmental relations during this era of globalization, technological advances. So intergovernmental relations are not fixed at a point in time, but they're always evolving. So that was the first piece that context matters. The second part was we heard about different approaches to intergovernmental cooperation. Some were very top down, where the federal government was important in making any kind of cooperation happen. Others were bottom up, where local governments or provinces, cantons, etc., initiated the cooperation. And yet others were a combination of top down and bottom up. So in Switzerland, for example, and I mentioned this before, local autonomy is very important. The federal government doesn't get involved in cooperation mechanisms between municipalities or cantons. And interestingly, our speaker said municipalities and cantons don't really like to cooperate unless they have to. Argentina is a much more centralized country with a more top down approach to cooperation. In the centralized and telecommunal party system, after which states began to have more influence. And in Canada, coordination, we were told, is bottom up and top down. The federal government has the resources, but the provinces have most of the responsibilities, and the provinces tend to be the drivers of cooperation in Canada. In many cases, cooperation was very informal. You know, we use the term ad hoc a lot. There was ad hoc cooperation. So for example, in Canada and Argentina, uh, provincial ministers in different sectors meet on a sectoral on sectoral issues. So, for example, you'll have the provincial ministers of education meet or the provincial ministers of health meeting. But again, not very formal mechanisms. The third thing we talked about was evaluating the success or failure of intergovernmental cooperation. Uh, and this is where it seemed that there is very little systematic evaluation in any of the countries, unlike what Constantino was talking about in trying to measure uh, outcomes of uh, ownership. To some extent, we heard that there's scholarly work uh, to address whether costs go down, for example, and service quality improves with coordination, but really that's not systematic, that those are you know, individual studies. In Argentina, we heard the Ministry of the Interior collects data on provinces and municipalities, and the federal councils also have a data coordinating role. But this information is not necessarily focused on evaluating intergovernmental cooperation. In Canada, we heard intergovernmental agreements are not legally binding, and they're not enforceable, so there's no mandatory reporting on results. In India, we heard that commissions from time to time look at the impact of intergovernmental cooperation, but again, nothing systematic. So to conclude, uh, uh, you know, our, the summary of, of yesterday's conversation, there's no one model of intergovernmental cooperation that stands above the rest, but there are some interesting examples of cooperation in each of the countries we heard from on the panel yesterday. It's clear, though, we need to do more work to understand these models and to evaluate what they've been able to achieve. So that brings us to today's panel. We have four excellent panelists with vast experience on the topic of intergovernmental cooperation. Our panelists are, firstly, Nico Stadler. Uh, Nico is Professor and Research Chair in Multilevel Government Law and Policy at the Dulla Omar Institute of Constitutional Law, Governance and Human Rights 
at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. Johanna Schnabel is a lecturer and chair of German politics at the Otto Sur Institute for Political Science at Freie University in Berlin, Germany. Andrea Chavez Gonzalez is director of international relations at the National Institute for Federalism and Municipal Development in Mexico. And Pablo Sanabria Pulido is associate professor and director of graduate programs in the School of Government at the Universitat de los Andes in Colombia. And he is also an affiliate professor in public administration division at CETA in Mexico, but he will be talking about Colombia. So let me first pose the first question to our panelists uh, and I'll ask Nico to start off. The first question is, what are the key aspects that affect either positively or negatively the actual working of the intergovernmental regime in your country? And by key aspects, we're looking here at the, what's the institutional background that's relevant? What are the political arrangements? What are the operational mechanisms that affect the working of intergovernmental relations in your country. So, Nico, over to you. Um, Inet, thanks for the introduction, and it's always great to be on a panel that you moderate. Uh, and for the thanks to the forum for inviting me in this, particularly dealing with, with Brazil, because between Brazil and South Africa, there's great affinities because local government has been entrenched in our constitutions. And I think we've had a very good look or influenced by Brazil when we drafted our constitution. So very briefly, the structure of national government, nine provinces, um, then local government, uh, very few, 257, eight metros, metropolitan municipalities, the rest of the country in terms of local government is divided between districts, 44 district municipalities, and they will then be subdivided in 217 um, local municipalities. So large municipalities, very large metros, um, and the division of powers are entrenched in the constitution between provincial and national it is mostly concurrent so obviously necessity of cooperation but um, there's also specific uh, powers uh, given to to local government so igr um what is positive about it the positive of aspects one is it's a clear constitutional mandate you must cooperate that's the principle why we had a decentralization of government it must be to cooperate and not to cause conflict two it's been very uh, made very formal perhaps most formal in the world with a statute setting out um, the various structures for, national structures, provincial structures, and even at local government. So very formalized, and sometimes it works, sometimes not. And these formal structures, um, I would, and, and what we also would perhaps say is they work partly because there is such a single party dominance, eight of the nine provinces, and most of the municipalities belong to one political party, the African National Congress, which of course smooths and leads to a very hierarchical approach to, to intergovernmental relations. Yet, in the province that I live, uh, and the city, uh, Cape Town is in opposition hands, and there is a measure of tolerance which uh, is, is, is a positive, but the negative is it's only a measure. Another very important um, aspect is how organized local government is, or, or, or local government is organized, again, in terms of the constitution, to have a single voice. And, I, uh, and there's great comparisons between South Africa and Brazil, uh, between your level of organization or at local government level, but it's obviously a very different things. If you have five over 5,000 municipalities, uh, you have uh, 
it, it's a very different kettle of fish and you have 257. Very important to come back to um, you know, then, uh, Fernandez, Fernando's views is one, um, the problem of IGR, financial, and uh, the question of uh, the number of ministries uh, and placed in the hands of independent bodies, constitutional bodies, municipal demarcation board, uh, and the uh, finance and fiscal commission that advises on the uh, the distribution of funds. Um, last point of the positive side is there is a, a bit of a flexibility also within our system because in statute the presidents the presidents call, uh, infrastructure development council um, comprises of the president nine premiers of the provinces and the eight uh, executive mayors of the metros where the metro mayors have equal standing as the provincial premiers and the very reason is that the metro is now almost growing out of its basis as uh, as a local government and so that recognition that this is where infrastructure happens is in the cities have them um, uh, recognize that reality and include them in that council on the negative side of igr we see a bit of a top-down prov uh, provision an ideology of that which are facilitated by one dominant party which governs not through igr but through the political structure of the party the second uh, difficulty with igr is the uneven capacity or capability of provinces and local government you can't have intergovernmental relations successful and compacts or agreements if one party aren't able to provide uh, governance, proper governance, and and usually it's a lack of capacity, corruption, etc. So a major problem. Um, the third one difficulty is, as I almost mentioned, is local government is still viewed as a single body or single entity, yet it houses metros and small municipalities all with the same level of powers so a, a problem there and the third uh, or fourth point uh, uh, difficulty is the lack of trust to make horizontal igr and cooperation uh, possible very little of that we see where municipalities worked collectively with others part of the explanation is that the municipalities are so big already that they can operate fairly well on their own but there's often a difficulty of saying um to always have a win-win situation the last uh, limitation is of course political competition uh, and there's a measure of uh, not the best cooperation because of the political parties that differ from the national, provincial, and at local government, but it's confined to Cape Town and the Western Cape. So that's, I think, a bit more over five minutes. It was, but Thank it was you. a great beginning <laughs> to the conversation. And it was also a nice overlap with yesterday because yesterday we talked about constitutions, we talked about uh, dominant political parties, um, and of course, South Africa and Brazil, as, as you mentioned, both have local governments with original powers in the constitution. Canada always looks at those two countries to say they have done that, we have not.
Um, and so there's some very interesting parallels there. Uh, what is interesting, though, is how many local governments there are in Brazil and how few there are in South Africa. And um, so that was interesting. And I, I think you brought up a new theme, which is when we're talking about cooperation, we've got large municipalities and small municipalities with different capacities. And, and so bringing them together can sometimes be problematic. Uh, so thank you very much for that. I'm going to turn now to uh, Johanna. Is it Johanna? Yes, it is. Good. Johanna. Thank you. <laughs> thank Don't you want to be much. calling you by the wrong name <laughs> for the next two hours. <laughs> but I, I'm used to that, to be honest. <laughs> I don't mind. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me to, to that panel. I'm very happy to share some insights on, on German federalism. And I think um, the main aspect we need to keep in mind when talking about IGR in, in Germany, intergovernmental cooperation, is that in Germany there are uh, many and very strong incentives to cooperate. And they come on the one hand from uh, related to a few context factors that I'm, I would like to talk about, but at the same time also about in, in the way the federal system is designed. And so we're talking about the, the context in which intergovernmental uh, relations operate. We need to keep in mind that Germany is a very homogeneous country, at least compared to, to other countries, that lacks any kind of distinctive region or, or unit. And now I'm thinking here about Quebec or Catalonia that might complicate intergovernmental relations. So we don't have that. And we also have on top of this homogeneity and the non-existence of a distinctive unit, a very strong preference among the German population for uniformity and harmonization. So very much dislike of, of any kind of policy diversity. And on top of that, we have a fiscal equalization system that equalizes fiscal capacity to a very strong degree and a constitutional mandate to um, promote equal living conditions. So again, all this uh, very much uh, offers in incentives for intergovernmental cooperation. Another strong is incentives com incentive comes from uh, Germany's membership in the European Union. The federal government represents Germany in negotiations at the federal level. Um, but nevertheless, a lot of these decisions that relate uh, to the European Union and concern responsibilities of, of the lender and also information that the lender has the federal government might not have. So also that means that they need to, to coordinate. And I think another factor we should keep in mind when talking about the success of intergovernmental relations in Germany is the economic context. At least in recent years, Germany has been doing very well economically, and that reduces a number of conflicts that could otherwise uh, emerge. And also, and I'll go back to that later on, um, it allows the federal government in a way to buy uh, lender cooperation in many regards. Um, so the, these are a number of, of context factors I would like to highlight. But then uh, we also have the way the federal uh, system is designed, it also offers very strong incentives to, to cooperate. And here I'm mainly thinking about administrative federalism in combination with joint decision making. So administrative federalism means that uh, any kind of federal legislation is implemented by, by the lender. And so the federal government always relies on lender cooperation, their expertise, their capacity and their willingness to implement federal legislation. And you know, in exchange for, for that, or as a consequence of that, the lender participate in federal decision making via the Bundesrat, that's a federal, federal chamber that consists of heads of, of the lender government and other ministers of lender government. But cooperation is very much uh, institutionalized in, in the system. But on top of that, and also as a consequence of that, Germany has developed a um, a very highly institutionalized system of intergovernmental councils, some of which are horizontal, so only um, meetings of, of the lender, and others involve the federal government. The federal government is a member, but even in horizontal councils where the federal government is not an official member, it's very often invited to attend the meetings for the purpose of information exchange. Um, and so all this leads to um, a, a situation where we have ongoing coordination and cooperation. It's very dense and very frequent and regular. And this is also supported by, and I think that's very important to keep in mind, by informal relations between bureaucrats. There's a very dense networks of um, between bureaucrats of the different lenders, sometimes held by parties, but sometimes um, just by a common uh, education. And the existence of core executives that play the role as of, a, of a coordinator between the different across levels, but also between, between the lender. So overall, we have a smooth functioning intergovernmental relations system. 
This does not mean that things are always very, very easy and work perfectly well. There are also a few uh, aspects that are that can cause some, some problems. And I'm mainly thinking here about um, a certain tendency to gridlock and suboptimal outcomes. So the fact that uh, a large number of actors need to agree on something before, before something actually happens makes um, quick and decisive uh, decision and action unlikely. We've seen that now in a pandemic, some are different to this, difficult to decide on further further measures that led to a delay in obviously in higher infection rates, death and hospitalizations. It also makes fundamental reforms unlikely. So fiscal equalization is something that's been discussed very often. Um, fundamental reforms in education policy are complicated um, by that. And fundamental reforms of this is the system as such. And also, and I think that has been mentioned yesterday, um, there are different capacities of um, of, of the lender, although there is a fiscal equalization system, but because some lenders are much richer than others, um, the typical conflicts that you find in other federations between um, net payers and beneficiaries of fiscal equalization exist in Germany and have led to, to conflicts between the lender and also to more to, to many demands by lender for uh, compensation by from the federal government. So there are, are on a regular basis conflicts about federal financial support, especially to the rich, to the poor lender, um, that have not been that pronounced as I mentioned earlier because of the, the good economic situation. But they they are there are structural conflicts about um, about that. Then I think another factor that can be seen as a driver of, of cooperation and coordination can also be seen as a downside in a way to the working of the federal system as such. And that's the strong pressure for harmonization and uniformity that I've mentioned, which leads to more cooperation, but at the same time provides very little scope for policy experimentation and hence uh, learning. So it can be seen as a, as a constraint. Then finally, and I'll, I'll finish on that, um, all these intergovernmental negotiations uh, as long as they don't happen in federal parliaments so between the Bundestag and Bundestag, the two chambers are um, behind, happen behind closed doors. So there's very little public scrutiny, lack of transparency. I think if we're talking about intergovernmental cooperation, we also need to keep these, let's say, democratic aspects in mind. Again, that is something that Germany shares with other, with other countries, but it's definitely something um, that we need to, to consider when talking about intergovernmental relations. And those would be my first remarks. Thank you, Hannah. Forward well, to the second round. Those, those are great, great uh, con uh, contextual remarks and, and, and setting Germany apart from some of the other examples in terms of this homogeneity and desire for uniformity. Uh, that makes cooperation good, but as you say, it makes innovation a little bit uh, more problematic. Um, also, the economic context is, is um, figuring in here um in causing less conflict when we're all doing well we're we're less worried about about things like fiscal equalization although when you said one of the problems was uh conflict over fiscal equalization that sounds pretty familiar to a canadian and i'm sure to other other countries as well so thank you very much for that i'm going to turn now to andrew Uh, I hope you are having a good morning and are feeling well. For me, it's a pleasure to participate in this important forum. And first, uh, I want to talk about the, Mexi the Mexican system to stay in a little bit of context. Uh, Mexico is a representative and dem democratic republic made of free states united by a federal pact Mexico has a system of separation of powers. The executive that, that oversees the president currently, Mr. Andres Manuel López Obrador, the legislature in charge of Congress of the Union and the judicial, where they head in the Supreme Court of Justice. We have 32 federal entities, including Mexico City, and 2,400 55 local governments and these municipalities are governed by the mayors of average period of three years with the right of re-election and local governments are governed by a town hall for a period of three years with a re-election process and now to answer the important question i would like to mention that for there to be in governmental cooperation uh, an important point is the coordination without it it will be impossible 
So a good in institutional agreement is, is, is it's essential to promote cooperation in the provision of services in areas that demand specific spatial configurations, such as uh, weather, severage systems, and health services, and where the interest and benefits for each level of government in the, in the provision of these services differ. In Mexico, the, the coordination between our three level government federal, state of, or provincial and municipal, which is very relevant to achieve the development of, of, of a better government. It depends on two defining factors, the political will, like um, it defined um, voluntad política, and the actual compliance with our constitutional local laws, and it could be cumplimiento legal, and I see the political will as a key aspect because if we refer to the cooperation, we are talking about two or more involved and for any uh, agreement to be carried out, the, the will see need first of all. And the commitment to cooperation also depends on the determination of the authorities to overcome political rivalries formal uh, uh, arrangements can be established but cannot function properly if there is lack of will and incentive to cooperate. The intention of the central government or the federal government uh, is to create a, region, a regional authority for the fulfillment of cooperation and cannot work if such attempts led to a conflict with the political autonomy of subnational governments, states, and local governments. And as I said, I consider that the second defining factor for the intergovernmental cooperation is the actual complaints with the, our constitutional and local laws because they are the basis of everything. With, without laws, we, there is nothing. But also, if there are and they are not full, there is nothing. And I conclude my participation participation with three key elements that summarize my answer in order of intergovernmental cooperation to be achieved in it's necessary the political will or voluntad politica the commitment and also the surrender thank you thank you very much so um that, that was a really interesting conversation and you've brought in some new elements and particularly political will you spend a lot of time talking about you, you really need people to want to make this happen and there's lots of reasons to cooperate uh, but you, you need the politicians on side to make it happen so thank you for that and we're going to turn now to Pablo Sanabria Pulido to talk about Colombia Thank you, Anit, and thank you, everyone. Thank you to the Forum of Federations, ITAC, and IKEA for the invitation. So, Colombia is a unitary decentralized country. So, that means that those two words mean that uh, we have both the best and the worst of both. This is an almost unique model, even in the context of Latin America, that tries to, to combine centralized and decentralized um, models. The country has been, during the last 30 years, trying to develop this decentralization model from the 1991 constitution. And it has been quite successful in developing healthy relationships between the national and national governments. For instance, we have seen a very cooperative relationship during the pandemic in Colombia between both the national and national governments. Um, centralization, however, remains an issue. Um, and there are some effects from the constitution that we should take into consideration. Colombia has 1,103 municipalities, and they are the net winners of the new constitution. This has some implication, in some implications for the other subnational units. Um, since the issues of the new constitution, they have gained, I mean, the municipalities have gained more autonomy and liberty to decide and implement policies, particularly in social policy. So there are different factors that have explained why now the municipalities are more pow powerful vis-a-vis -vis the national government and even the uh, province governments. So first, uh, the constitution established cooperation as one of the principles, uh, subsidiarity as one, as one of the principles of the um, um, new international relationship. 
constitutional protections um, are provided for the autonomy of national units, even though the executive branch is, is very powerful and has undertook some actions that some analysts see as recentralization during the last 30 years. Um, it seems that with some people, the uh, high level of decentralization is, is not as good as, as other people think. However, there are some other factors that have helped to develop um, a more powerful subnational units, um, again, I mean, towards the national government. First, a sophisticated system of cities and metropolitan areas, uh, very similar to what we were recently about and about the case of Brazil, which have developed enough power and legitimacy to interact with the national government. So they, they have become like very, very powerful players in the uh, multi-level government um, in scenario of Colombia. This is a country of region of several countries. So here there's a, there is a strong concern um, about the needs and demands of the region and about how to perceive the national government. So that there's a lot of concern about the governance and the way the national government is dealing with this relationship with the, with the regional authorities and the regional elites. So this tends to keep in control the strong centralist forces that characterize the executive branch, which is, as I said, is very powerful. And they actually have understood, I mean, the national level has understood that they have to play a main role in policy coordination. That's something that has somehow um, been developed during the last 30 years. It wasn't not like that. Uh, it wasn't like that at the beginning of, of the new constitution. However, there are other factors that uh, erode the capacity and the authority of subnational units. For instance, um, the lack of fiscal uh, capacity of some of them, most of them don't develop their own funds, make them in a vulnerable position vis a vis the national government. This also makes that the most dynamic populated regions tend to be more easily listened by, listened by the national government than the other subnational units. So informality in Colombia generates some sort of, of asymmetry between the national units. All in all, what we see is a dynamic scenario in which both national and subnational units have some leeway and tools to develop cooperation and improve multilateral governance. governance. However, the predominance of the executive branch and the high levels of clientelism and political patronage also facilitate bargaining and relationship between both levels end up affecting the institutional capacity of, of some subnational units and generate high levels of heterogeneity in administrative capacity and bargaining power across subnational units. Thank you. Thank you much. Um, so uh, local autonomy is a big thing in Colombia uh, that you're talking about with the constitution and subsidiarity being the principle in the constitution. Uh, but notwithstanding that, like cities around the world, lack of fiscal capacity uh, becomes an issue. So uh, again, some of these themes were like yesterday, some are a little bit different. Um, I did promise a five minute break. And so what I propose is we take a five minute break. And for those of you who were with me yesterday, five minutes is five minutes. I, I will call us back at uh, by 1020. And then we're going to talk about uh, the role played by central and provincial state governments in intergovernmental cooperation. And uh, we may have to zip through a little faster on that second question. So we have time for audience discussion. So um, I've got 1014, let's say 1020, uh, we will return. Um, I want to go now to the second round of questions, and I'm going to ask that the speakers go. Well, I don't. I don't want you to talk faster, but I want you to take a little less time so that we can get to the the Q and A period. So the qu second question uh, is about uh, what is the role played by the central and provincial state governments in the intergovernmental cooperation regime. So, Nico, I'm going to start with you. Okay. As I've explained, um, there's a well-functioning or well-designed system of intergovernmental relations. Um, and from a national level, it's the presidency that organizes the president's coordinating council. 
which is the peak body. And that council consists of the nine premiers, president and one or two ministers, plus the, uh, um, the chair of the organized local government in South Africa. So it covers all three levels. So it was very interesting for us to see how this structure now suddenly faced with the dilemma of COVID, COVID-19, which had to deal with matters that were concurrent, health, disaster management, education, and so on. And suddenly when there was the pressure um, where you should have expected cooperation through all three levels, we see the nationalization of the issue and COVID response through a informal cabinet committee called the National Coordinating Command Council. And so um, it showed a bit the fragility of our system. However, before the President's Coordinating Council would meet every twice a year, in the COVID crisis it met uh, ovens weekly or uh, monthly as, as the crisis went on. So very strong uh, centralization and also in its design. What I also suggested was that your president of the political party plays an extremely strong role in uh, disseminating leadership through the premiers, eight of the nine uh, belonging to his party. So a fairly top-down approach um, in the role that the national government plays. Um, then at the provincial level, we have the same structure. There's the Premier's Intergovernmental Forum, where the Premier had to get, must get together with the mayors of uh, the, the municipalities, um, the district municipalities. And um, it is much more equal, and the language of the statute is a much more uh, uh, a relationship of, of equality, where they discuss matters of general concern. So um, sometimes municipalities still complain that uh, we are listening, we are it's information sessions rather than us. Uh, participating in bringing our matters to the fore, because both the President and the Premier, in fact, determines the agenda. Um, what we would see um, is also the contextual way, apart from these IGR forums, of how provinces would start taking leadership in trying to get horizontal coordination um, between municipalities going. Um, and the one particular example, which may be very relevant to, to Brazil, was in the, the uh, biggest or most populous province of Gauteng which is where Johannesburg, the industrial uh, financial uh, capital of, of the country is. And there are three metros, which are cheek by jowl. Uh, they are uh, one integrated system, uh, uh, factually. But it wouldn't, in the end, be a, a municipality of over 10 million people if it would become one municipality. So it's divided into three. Um, so very large, but the cooperation between them has not become organically from the three from the three metros. But there was some level of leadership that the province then takes, which says we can try to coordinate matters. For example, the province then would provide the rapid transport system, uh, rail system that links the three municipalities. But, uh, and, and here would be an example.
example, where the province can uh, under these particular circumstances. So um, I think both national government and provincial government plays an important role, but that must always be seen as, is it a dominating role uh, or is it one of initiative? And it's a difference. The one is that we tell you what to do. The other one is we can take the initiative, but the aim is here to listen to one another and try to come to some agreements. Like in Canada, uh, intergovernmental agreements are not law. It is not legally binding. The decisions taken at these forums must be internalized at each level of government for it to, to, to be implemented directly. Um, yeah, so let me stop there. Thanks. Great, thank you. I love the, is it a dominating role or is it taking initiative? That's a very good question. Uh, but it sounds very top down in South Africa. Um, it, and, but interesting that local governments are also represented on this um, coordinating council, which we don't see in Canada, actually. We have federal provincial forums, but not including local governments. Uh, Johanna, tell us about Germany. Yeah, so um, Germany has, as I mentioned before, a functional distribution of power whereby the federal government passes legislation and which the lender implement. Um, there are few areas for which the lender are responsible. It's mainly education, culture and the police, where they pass legislation, implement their, their own uh, legislation. So in a way, we have a situation where the federal government makes many strategic decisions and the lender make more decisions on operation, administration and, and the details. I think that's a, that's a general um, yeah, a federal framework within German federalism, which fe German federalism operates. Um, and in this framework, in a way, the federal government and the lender are partners. So they share, we can see that in public finances, they share uh, major taxes. They are engaged in joint monitoring of budgets. They have a joint fiscal rule, the so-called debt break, and uh, an institution that monitors compliance with, with the debt break. Um, they share responsibilities in many other policy areas. If you take the example of healthcare, which I guess is, is very topical given the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we have a situation where health insurance and health insurance funds um, the recurring cost of hospitals is a federal government responsibility, while hospital planning, operation and capital funding are responsibilities of the constituent units and um, municipalities who operate under, um, under the, the constituent units. So um, intergovernmental relations, so federal government lend are more or less partners, obviously with one of the partners having a superior fiscal capacity, that's a federal government. And, and in a way we can see that partnership in the way intergovernmental relations work. As I said earlier, there are vertical councils with the federal government, there are horizontal councils that just uh, involve the, the lender and um, the federal government can use these councils for like top down, um, uh, to promote top down uh, initiatives. But there are also bottom-up relations. There are also many situations in which the, the lender formulate demands vis-a-vis -vis the federal government. They often use horizontal councils. So if we look at the outputs they, they generate, they're very often about the lender asking the federal government to either pay for something, uh, to defend a certain position at the European level, or to just take action um, on, on something. And then obviously, a horizontal uh, relations cannot be underestimated, uh, overestimated, sorry. Um, they are very important, especially in the area of education where the lender are very active in coordinating education policy. They have um, established joint education standards, uh, joint school leaving um, standards, and, and so on. So that, that, is, uh, that is also very important. I think one pattern is that the federal government often ends up paying. That is a mechanism that, that can resolve blockage. We've seen it in the recent negotiations of fiscal or reform of fiscal equalization, where the, end, the lender came up with a proposal, and the proposal was for the government to pay to pay more, which it uh, would ended up uh, up doing. And um, 
And so if there is conflict, it's very often about financial support. There have been in the past situations where lender asked for federal bailouts that worked until the federal government said no, that led to conflicts uh, between that. Recently, we have also seen that um, in regard to the, the debt break, where the poorer lender asked for more federal compensation. The federal government provided, but obviously that, that creates um, cer certain conflicts and puts the federal government in a, in a dominating position in the sense that it can decide how much uh, compensation it, it provides and how much financial support um, it provides. Um, yeah, and I think that uh, I'll, I'll stop there and happy to answer any more questions during the Q&A part. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so top down and bottom up. Um, and it sounds pretty harmonious <laughs> with the odd financial conflicts. Um, Andrea, over to Mexico. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, I think that the role that governments play is key. So that cooperation can be carried out as i mentioned before coordination between the three levels will be successful and i want to say that coordination means the synchronization and unification of actions to provide adequate adequate quality um, opportunity and direction uh, in such as a way that the, there is a harmony and cooperation to achieve uh, a common goal. And it is important to highlight the coordinated work and that each authority fulfills its responsibilities. Um, the political and administrative government system of Mexico is like a Swiss watch because that allows us to govern a population of 125 million and develop the 14 economy in the world thanks to the, the, the coordinations that exist between our three levels of government. And also the, the governments are made up of uh, municipal and state public leaders. And I, I think that if each one of them knows the constitutional the constitutional laws and is trained frequently they will be ready to develop their government and, and also it's important to highlight the that each government must must assume its responsibilities have common objectives and achieve an increase in the in the quality of life of the population um, I would like to give an example. Um, in Mexico, the federal government uh, has the National Institute of for Federalism and Municipal Development in AFED, which I am representing today. And it is a decentralized administrative body of the Ministry of the Interior, whose objective is to, to formulate, conduct, and also evaluate the policies and action of the federal public administration in matters of federalism, decentralization, and municipal development. Uh, the intergovernmental cooperation is key for the development of local governments, and it, and it, and it is a work of day a day uh, with clear objectives, objectives, commitment, and also the political will as I mentioned before. And in addition to this, I want, I want to say that these spaces are so relevant because we learn from all the nations and also expand our way for working and developing the, the role that corresponds to the federal state or the provincial and the municipal governments. And finally, uh, I conclude my participation with three key elements that summarize my answer and the role of the governments is nations commitment and responsibility to assume their obligations and achieve their development great Thank thanks you. thanks very much and and um, you're, you're sticking with the commitment and political will of coordination and these are important concepts um pablo and colombia thank you Anna. so as I mentioned before, municipalities are the, were the net winners of the new political constitution in 1991. In contrast, departments or the provincial level in Colombia are characterized as the net losers of that process. Um, they, in Colombia, we have 32 departments and one capital district. 
the departments are supposed to be in charge of the implementation of social policy for the less developed municipalities. Uh, those are the categories three, four, five, and six of the national system of municipalities in Colombia, which are essentially the ones with lower institutional capacities. So the idea was that the departments could collaborate, cooperate to help the implementation of, of uh, social policy in the municipalities. However, as the time has gone, the municipalities have understood that they can bypass the authority of the departments and that they can go directly to the national government. So this is something that has affected the kind of relationship that the departments have with the national government and even uh, among municipalities. So in this dynamic scenario um, has put the departments in a strange limbo in terms of its role in multi-level governance in Colombia. Sometimes people ask, what, what, what is their role? What do they do? So the national level is in charge of providing national guidance for different policy domains. They define the allocation of funding and transfers to the subnational units. Although it not necessarily directly involved in key policy areas, it keeps control on the implementation of other areas. For instance, some topics of social assistance, infrastructure, security and defense, among others. So the idea that is that the national level complements the capacity of the subnational units. One recent phenomenon that is either eroding or improving the capacity of, of the provincial level is the increasing um, um, existence of territorial associated schemes, which have dynamized the relationships among subnational units. Uh, but essentially, the municipalities have become even more and more active about. Um, this sort of new arrangements. Another recent source of power that has increased in the role of municipality is the, um, the greater role that new associations of uh, municipalities and even departments are playing as intergroups towards the national government. So they have become more influential, they have become strong, become strong political actors. So the national level concentrates the powers, the key powers, but it is usually willing to cooperate with the subnational units. So this, it, it, is, it is, as in the case of Germany, a combination of both top-down and bottom-up system. Um, the subnational units remain highly dependent in terms of finance and politics, but they still have some leeway and authority to negotiate with the uh, national government. So Colombia is both a mix of both models, and cooperation remains highly informal not necessarily equal amounts of national units, as I mentioned in my first answer. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, I'm sorry if the translators did not hear that, but Pablo was talking about uh, how the constitution has made cities very important, more so than departments, and that they are learning that they can bypass departments and go straight to the national government, which, you know, we talk about in other countries as well. Do you have to go through the departments or provincial governments or can you talk directly with the national governments? He also talked about the importance of associations of municipalities being very influential. Um, and he said the national government has more of a coordinating role and they're willing to work together. Uh, so, and, and you concluded by saying it's a mixture of top down and bottom up. I hope I've captured that well and that can get translated for those who may have missed um, uh, some of the remarks. So we're going to open discussion now. So at the bottom of your screen on your Zoom, there's a reactions function. And if you click on that, there's a raise hand function. And if you raise your hand, um, I will recognize you and you can ask uh, a question. But I'm just gonna start uh, quickly and I'm gonna ask you to go around very quickly to talk about um, you know, Constantino talked about how you evaluate the outcomes of, of public consortium. So I, I want to ask the question about evaluating the results of intergovernmental cooperation and what data you need to do that. So specifically, what recommendations or initiatives exist for a periodic evaluation of the results of intergovernmental cooperation in your country? Are there reliable databases that can be used for evaluation of intergovernmental cooperation. Nico, are you, are you there? Okay, maybe Johanna, do you want to take that on? Oh, there's Nico, sorry. Okay, but let Johanna go first. Okay, Johanna, maybe you could go first. And just quickly, because we want to get to the uh, open discussion. 
Sure. Yeah. And I think my, my answer can be very short. I'm not aware of any uh, periodical systematic evaluation of the corporation regime. All I know is that there is a joint monitoring of, of budgets and public finances. Um, there are certain policy evaluations that are required by um, programs funded by the federal government. There has been a digitalization pact for schools that comes with reporting and, and um, policy uh, evaluation requirements. There are a few um, economic, uh, academic studies that examine policy diversity and uniformity. Um, we have certain insights. I, I've, I've developed an indicator to compare intergovernmental councils and their functioning, but I'm not aware of any database that would provide a comprehensive overview and allow for evaluation of intergovernmental cooperation in, in general. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nico, do you want to go next? Uh, yes, I think very much similar situation um, that, you know, th there's been some studies done about how often does a district in intergovernmental forum meets, what are the, uh, the topics with the decisions, how effective it was, but it's, it's much more sort of the dynamics and not likely to show what are the economic outputs. Very often also one where negative studies by saying, well, these were the result of not having cooperation. So uh, not measuring uh, the success, but almost measuring the lack of success. But um, I think there's a lot of problems regarding the methodology. What are you measuring? What can be measured? Um, how do you measure good cooperation in one case and bad cooperation at the other? Um, can it produce two statistics? So it, it's really a challenging uh, aspect uh, that one can see. And very often the, uh, the, the studies that I got involved with are country by country where in some countries you have a very good uh, in IGR system operating. And here the test was how well did they deal with COVID and compared that with study, uh, countries where with a poor uh, IGR system and cooperation and there the results were poor, uh, uh, poor COVID-19 uh, uh, engagements and, and um, action. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Andrea, do you want to, no, you don't respond okay. Uh, Pablo, any comments on how to measure any of these impacts? I don't think there are any evaluations about that. Usually there are some studies that um, analyze the implication from a legal or fiscal perspective but there are not like general evaluations of cooperation and the outcomes of cooperation in Colombia. However, I just remember that we are just finishing the local autonomy index. Probably some of you guys know that this is a project that some European scholars developed. So we are finishing the one in Colombia and I know there are other countries in Latin America that are uh, updating the um, database. So that's something that might probably help do that evaluation in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, I can tell you that at our institute uh, at the University of Toronto, uh, a few years ago, we had a few studies done on intermunicipal agreements to deliver services. And uh, we, the, the author who worked on this, uh, um, Zach Spicer, uh, tried to look at all of these agreements and, and tried to see why people entered into them. And often it was about cost savings, improving service delivery. But again, it was very difficult to get the information or the data to evaluate whether they actually were succeeding or not. But there are that's a little bit of work we've done in that area. Um, again, I'm, I'm going to ask people to raise their hands and ask questions. Uh, this is a good opportunity when we have four different countries represented. Um, we do have a, a question left over from yesterday from one of our Brazilian colleagues. Um, and the question was this, uh, the inter-institutional cooperation in public transportation is very weak in Brazil. How does that, that theme work in your countries? So I guess the question is, is there intergovernmental cooperation on public transportation and, and how does that work? 
Anybody, Nico, you've unmuted. Do you want to answer that for South Africa? Yes. Um, uh, transport is, is, is uh, typical. It's a hot potato at the moment here in the Western Cape. Um, railways is, suggest is to be a, a national function um, and not very clear whether it's provincial. Now, the city of Cape Town um, wants to run actually railway in the metro, and it's a large metro, um, and now they seek and, and at the moment, the national government simply are not able to provide an efficient service. So the aim is to either take it over by the, by the city or try to get some agreement that the city has direct impact of, of, of the railways. Because it affects uh, the city's functionality. Is if, if the railways can't move a half a million people uh, a day, uh, the, the, the main roads just clog up, it uh, reduces productivity, and so on. But the nub of it now becomes political, because the city of Cape Town uh, is a democratic alliance uh, and, and very sort of, uh, and, 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 and not a, a very workable relationship with the ANC, which were, sits at, at national. So you have then this deadlock, in, uh, unable to get to some agreement, which turns out to be a win-win situation. Because uh, the great success, if the DA makes transport works better, it's a vote catcher. So, so you have very complex features institutional uh, pressures that uh, militates against an effective uh, public transport system. Um, now, in the, in the context of railways, the city has got a fairly decent one running at the moment in terms of bus services, but uh, the big infrastructure of, of, of railways, that has not yet been devolved to municipalities, due to the city of Cape Town, uh, to the great disadvantage of the functioning of the city. So, the, thank, thank you. So, there's no bodies that bring in both levels of government to run public transportation. It's more that it's done at one level or the other, and and they try to cooperate or send yep. funds. At, at the moment, it, it's the South African uh, Rail Service, a a, a, a public entity uh, controlled by the national government. Right. Now the aim would be is to see whether there can be a, a, a almost a tripartite uh, agreement between the province, the city, um, and, and the national government. Because something has to be done. Uh, the national uh, uh, state and enterprise are on its own, not able to provide a decent one. And whether it now has to go to the brink where the thing nearly collapses uh, before it, it, it uh, before there's some agreement, but this is where politics um, becomes uh, problematic. And back to something um, Fernando said earlier on is local autonomy. Is it a problem or not? Local autonomy is not an issue it is that local authorities are simply the basis on which political parties organize themselves. And so it is political competition. You see it in the US extremely, uh, that it is either you're Democrat or Republican and you then carve out your little fiefdom uh, uh, in, in, in the system. Um, and whether it's a local interest doesn't really matter. It becomes, a, in a sense, a national interest for a political party. And so, in a sense, it shares power in a way, but it also hampers uh, cooperation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Johanna, can you talk a bit about public transportation in Germany? 
So I think it's uh, it's a bit similar to South Africa in the sense that um, all three levels of government are also involved. Uh, highways, for example, are federal government responsibility. Some roads are taken are responsible of the lender and others of the municipalities. And the same um, applies to to trains and, and buses. Um, now, I, that's definitely not my area of, of expertise, so I can mainly speak about as a private citizen having lived in Germany for a bit. Um, and the systems are, are integrated. So, for example, nowadays you can buy a ticket on the National uh, Railway website or, or app, phone app and, um, and buy a ticket for a local bus service, for some local bus services via, via that app. So and there are certain bus services that are provided across municipal uh, levels. So the municipalities work together on providing these, these services. Now, how, what exactly, what kind of um, form that takes, I am not very sure. I am not aware of any like, national coordinating body that would meet regularly to, to discuss infrastructure, but there's definitely coordination cooperation going on. Okay, thank you. Andrea, do you want to talk about Mexico? Well, in Mexico, we have the the Ministry of the of the Secret I don't know Secretaría de Desarrollo Urbano, and it's it is in charge of transport, the streets, and also the infrastructure, and also that we have in enough that a collaborations to uh, and it conducts courses focused on municipal and state leaders. So it provides the elements and the strategies to, to be, I don't know how to say, but that the service could be more better and better. And I, I know that we have a lot of opportunities in transport, but this ministry works a lot for get more, much better and better and better. And that's it. Okay, thank you. Pablo? Hi, thank you. So here we go to see if you listen to me well. <laughs> um, so the institutional cooperation in public transportation in Colombia is very weak. Um, there's a national ministry of transport and uh, it is assumed that in the huge infrastructure projects, the national level plays a key role and cooperates with the departments and the municipalities. However, in practice, all the big public transportation projects occur and happen in the municipalities. And the municipalities are usually really bad to cooperate with other subnational units, even though they are in big metropolitan areas. And um, it has been a challenge for several municipalities to give it up. Um, massive transport systems in Colombia. Um, the ones that have been successful are developed contingent bodies created for that, like regional transport authorities, but they are still in progress. I mean, there are, there are some of these projects for metropolitan trains and suburban rails that are uh, up and just developing in Colombia. These are recent developments, so we'll see how it works in the future. Right now, they are cooperating and they are developing like a new kind, kind of, of bodies. Okay, um, I do have a, a comment and question here um, from Constantino. Um, he says, it is impressive that in general, there are not evaluations to measure the local or regional impacts in terms of social welfare or even in, provision, in the provision of specific public services, am I right? How could we understand the real effects of public policies shared by federative entities to balance public supply and social demand? So I think we've established that you are right, that there isn't much in the way of evaluations of impacts, and you're sort of saying, how could we actually do that? Are there any? Any comments on that? And I see, I see uh, Marcelo has a hand up as well, and we will, we will get to that. Johanna? Yeah, I can maybe nuance uh, 
the uh, or, or answer his question about whether he's right to, a bit. Um, he's he's right, but not completely right. At least in in Germany, I can say that there is no so there's no evaluation of that um, that across policy areas or policy programs, but even individual policy programs are evaluated. For example, I, I mentioned earlier this uh, agreement between the federal government and the lender, whereby the federal government provided money to the lender to um, promote digitalization of, uh, at schools to, to assist them in modernizing schools, essentially. That's a program where the lender have to submit two reports every year to the federal government to show progress and, and report on what they have done, what they have used the money for. But then more importantly, after the end of the, at the, end of the, the agreement, there will be a policy evaluation. It will be done by an independent um, expert that will establish whether putting that money into the school system will have, will, so that, that will be a cost benefit analysis that will examine whether the objectives um, that have led to the creation of the program have been achieved. But again, that is one very specific program that exists in other programs as well, but that's not across, across programs. Thank you. Do any of the other panelists want to respond to that question? Nico? Yeah, the, the, obviously uh, there are valuations done by government um, in the context, say, of conditional grants, where very specifically they would say, yeah, have IT provisions for schools, how in fact has it happened? Has it been rolled out? But that's much more in a policy directive rather than a cooperative uh, measure because the, the grant conditions are set by the national government and that your sub-national governments, whether it's provinces or local government, must then report against those conditions. And there, there's evaluation. But more difficult is to say that to measure, and this is the difficulty I have, is whether the political will, there's always measuring political will about, yes, we are willing to engage in, in, in a, a cooperation and an agreement, and that we will show that this political cooperation, in fact, advances all of us so that there's a type of win-win situation. And I think that uh, is done an anecdotally, it's done on case studies, but I don't, particularly in, uh, talking about South Africa, not done on a consistent basis. Okay, thank you. Uh, Pablo. Thank you, Enid. Uh, in Colombia, there are some evaluations that are um, national level, but not in regional or local terms. Only some of the most developed national units have some sort of databases that allow them to assess cash transfer and those kind of projects. So it's not very common in Colombia. Okay, thank you. Okay, maybe Nico will go over to you and come back to Marcelo. Just thinking about reporting and, and evaluating um, in 2000 and uh, uh, five, we adopted a, a bill or a law called Intergovernmental Relations Framework Act, which sets out the whole um, IGR system and the ways in which you solve disputes, in which you make agreements. And part of it, uh, of one of the provisions of the act says an annual report on how that year's IGR worked and examples of good cooperation and so on. To my knowledge, there were, has only been one such report over the far past 15 years. So even government has not taken it seriously that it's a very useful thing to start evaluating um, you know, not sort of benefits, but also how did you, where were the disputes and how they were resolved so that one can learn from those. Thank Thanks. you. Marcelo, do you want to go ahead now? Yes, please. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yes, my question relates to uh, quality of public expenditure in a federalism system. The case that I'm a former economist from and director of IPEA. I'm now in Europe, living in Europe. But uh, the question is, Brazil has more than five 
5,500 municipalities. When the federal government make a voluntary transfer to some of these munici uh, municipalities, uh, their control and the, the analysis of the efficiency is restricted to the state level. Most of the states and most of the municipalities, the management of publish and uh, managers of public expenditures are not available or they have limited resources. So my question is, how in uh, the countries of the panelists uh, made exact some control on central government transfers to small municipalities? Okay, so the, the question is about uh, the federal government giving transfers, particularly to small municipalities, and, and what is the control uh, given that at the local level there isn't a lot of expertise or capacity uh, to address that? Uh, and, yes, exactly. Yes. Okay. Uh, who would like to answer that? Nico, Johanna, yeah. Andrea? Okay. Okay. Um, it's, it's a real question, it's a real issue, uh, even in South Africa. The, to start off, um, in South Africa, local governments collectively raise over 70% of their own income. So your big municipalities are largely self-sufficient. They rely on grants, conditional grants, mostly for infrastructure development. But your smaller municipalities that do not have access to property rights, uh, to, the, to the selling of electricity and water, they are much more reliant on transfers. Now, the grant that they receive can be either a block grant with no conditions or conditional grants. Now, with the majority uh, of municipalities, they would receive most of the money as a block grant. But the formula is such, uh, in terms of determining the, 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 the grant, we call it the equitable share, is that it's almost predetermined how they should spend the money. It's on the number of indigent households for free basic services of water and electricity and sewerage. So your your number of your your level of um, choice and policy choice are, are fairly limited. Nevertheless, there are huge gaps in capacity, and what we see now is rampant corruption, inefficiency, and then the national government. Oh no! So first, the province must intervene. And, and mostly on financial matters of trying to stop uh, maladministration corruption. And now we've gone a, a step further. Provinces are not performing that oversight role. And now a court uh, has in fact ruled that in terms of the constitution, it is now the obligation, not the uh, discretion of the national government to intervene in a municipality in order to address these um, institutional weaknesses to ensure that services are delivered. So the whole system is breaking down because of incapacity at the lowest level, which then a number of municipalities are now governed by administrators and, the, and, and it's the repeat uh, performance of administrators. They try to fix the, uh, the municipalities then on its own democratically, but a year or two later, they back in the mess. And the crisis that we are now facing in South Africa is the impact of COVID-19 on the budgets of municipalities and uh, the reduction in income, plus the increase in uh, responsibilities. So we in for a bit of a rough ride, particularly on this question. Thanks. Okay, uh, Johanna, any comments? Yeah, I think the, the German situation is a bit different in the sense that um, municipalities are entities of, of the lender of the constituent units. 
Um, and most of the financial support they get from the federal government is given to the lender who then pass it on to, um, to the municipalities, the lo local government. And um, so in a way, the, the lender have to report to the federal government. At the same, same time, the federal government imposes uh, conditions on, um, on, again, uh, yeah, like, like Nico said, on the use of, uh, of the money and very often other transparency requirements, reporting requirements that the municipalities will, will have to fulfill. So there, there is a certain monitoring going on and, um, and uh, yeah, and, and the lender have to have to publish that as well. And the lender have to publish their, their accounts, lender budgets are, are public. And so it can be seen how much money they give to, to municipalities. So I think that that is fairly uh, transparent. Yeah, I think that would, would be my uh, very short answer to your question. Thank you. Andrea, do you want to comment on transfers? No? Okay. Uh, Pablo? In Colombia is very similar to what Nico was saying about uh, South Africa. Uh, most transfers are predetermined, and the subnational authorities have um, no leeway to decide how to uh, invest and spend those funds. So they, they come predetermined by the national government. There are some sort of um, balance scorecard about the quality of the transfer and how the, and how the original authorities use them in order to um, assess from the national government perspective how good is the expenditure from the original needs and how good I mean how well are they using the, uh, the funds from the funders. Okay, thank you. So we have another question in the chat and it goes back to transportation. Uh, in connection with the topic of coordination in transport, I would like to ask about cooperation for carrying out investments in urban road infrastructure. In particular, is there cooperation between the federal government providing voluntary transfers and municipalities who perform the works? The cooperation is widely used in Brazil and involves approximately two thirds of Brazilian municipalities each year. Just to clarify, oh yeah, and he's working, talking about voluntary transfers. So, so is there a, a cooperation mechanism between federal government providing the voluntary transfers and the municipalities that perform the works? Nico, did you wanna? Okay, um, yes, uh, the, Again, in terms of the federal system, there's national roads, there are provincial roads, and then there are municipal roads. Um, and, and national government would look after the main arterial roads in the country and provinces within uh, the uh, in the province, connecting municipalities. And then roads, like in Cape Town, which is probably 100 kilometers in breadth and, and width, so a very large area. And here there would be uh, infrastructure grants that the municipality that a, a, municipality, a municipality like a metro would get from the national government. So it's a conditional grant um, that they have determined that uh, for urban development, urban, urban connectivity, that the funds will not come as a block grant but as a conditional grant um, and, and and then spent by the municipalities. What we just have to take a step back is that there is uh, sectoral IGR forums where the Minister of Transport would meet with the nine uh, members of the provincial cabinets for transport, as well as someone from the uh, from local government, where they would try to obviously have a bit of a grander vision about development of roads, and also within municipalities. Then, as as I said, uh, spoke earlier about the infrastructure coordination council the President's Infrastructure Coordination Council, which will deal then also with, with roads. And there, very importantly, 
was where the mayors of the eight metros sit next to, not below, next to the provincial premiers, because they would in fact be bigger players in municipal infrastructure, like, like the big, big roads, the big um, highways that run through the metros. So yes, it's, it's fairly integrated. It's done through conditional grants. Um, and there is, is a level of cooperation. And uh, every time I get stopped uh, next to the road for speeding, I always have a chat uh, to the, uh, uh, the traffic official. Now, for who do you work? Are you municipal? Are you provincial or national? <laughs> they said, well, this is a national road, but we have got the power to impose, uh, and he's a provincial police officer, uh, traffic officer. We may, in fact, tap on this very valuable source. And where the national road goes through a municipality, it's your municipal traffic cop that sits behind a tree and catches you. And in some municipalities, it's about 20% of the income. Okay, Nico, you've got to be the only person who asks the traffic cop that question. <laughs> I've had conversations with them about who does what and on what basis. Yeah, I hope that doesn't. I, I, I hope it doesn't increase the fine they charge you. <laughs> no, no. Sometimes they chatted so nicely and about their job and their difficult. Okay, you can go. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. Uh, Johanna, did you want to comment on that? On yeah, on so obviously, on road infrastructure? sure. And obviously, as a, as a German, I would never uh, speed and never get in that situation. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> other than that, again, the, this, the situation is fairly similar in that highways are a federal responsibility. There are so-called land, land roads that are a responsibility of the lender, and there are local roads, a responsibility of local government. And um, so local governments get um, financial support by the land that varies according to the arrangements that exist in, in each land. Now I know in, in Bavaria, for example, they get a, an unconditional grant in a way or like an equalization grant that allows them to fund um, or help assist them in funding um, local, local roads. And the federal ministry of um, transportation has uh, several projects that um, municipalities but also other entities can apply for so that's a that's a competitive grant that obviously then comes with conditions um, attached but that that's another yeah possibility to get additional funding for specific projects while um, the funding I was talking about within the land can be ongoing can be part of the equalization arrangement that exists between with between the municipalities of one uh, specific land okay thank you um, Andrea, you were answering questions on transportation. How about Pablo? Uh, I want to, to say oh, something. Please. Yes. Uh, well, in, in Mexico, we, well, in the current government of Mexico, we have uh, different federal programs for municipalities in European improvement and recovery of green spaces to have more inclusive wrestling cities. And however, it is important that all the local level public policies for urban improvement being to be created. And one of the main example of this is the use of the roads so for cycling. And that's it. Okay, thank you. Pablo. Thank you. Very, very quick. In Colombia, there's a separation. I mean, the national roads are built and managed by the national government. There's a lot of private parties, private sector participation. And in some sort of secondary and tertiary um, level, um, there are some cooperation with the departments and with the municipalities. And it has worked well. Um, but the most important works are mainly run by the national government. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to take this one last question from the chat, although I must say I have a couple more questions myself, but I think we're running out of time. So we'll do one more question. Uh, this is from Constantino. Um, the process, it's about budgeting. The process of budgeting is a core problem to make political decisions related to social choices in terms of public services to be provided. Can I understand that the federative arrangements is solved 
by the federal budget. Not exactly sure what that means. Constantino, do you want to jump in and just explain your question Sorry. a little? No, oh, because I, if I understand, yeah, everybody uh, talk about the coordination in terms of uh, transfers to another level of right. The, and the execution is just uh, done by the specific federative entity. It's local or province level. So, but uh, I understand that uh, the problem is just uh, a problem of uh, budgeting, a uh, budget like to allocate resource, financial resource among different levels, or there is a, a kind of uh, political decisions to, to choose a specific social choice, social demands, okay? Because there are different levels of demands of social and population of the society. And so if I understand, the, the budget maybe could be a, a, a crucial instrument to, to share the, the different problems among different levels of entities, you know? Okay, uh, Nico, do you, do you want to respond to that? Obviously the federal budget is critical only to so far as it controls and are sourced by the most important uh, taxes. Um, and in South Africa, it is vital, uh, the federal budget, for the budgets of the provinces, because provinces get 97% of their income, of their revenue, comes from the federal budget or the federal funds. And it's also the concept that one uses is that it's not federal money. It is money collected by the federal government on behalf of all three uh, levels of government. And then it is distributed in a objective, scientific, evidence-based way. Um, you would then say the local government, that federal budget is not so important. If in fact they are self-reliant onto the tune of over 73% of their, of their revenue, where they use own source revenue. So it, it's a factor of, of how you distribute your, 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 your tax uh, sources, the taxing powers between the three. But even if you make it, um, a block grant with no strings attached. The reliance of provinces in South Africa and receiving 35%, 37% of, of the national revenue collected are spent on teachers and medical staff. However, the teachers are paid at a national wage level determined by national bargaining. So when a province receives its, what we call equitable share, uh, which are large sums of money, 80% of that has already been earmarked for health, for education, for housing, because one determined that beforehand and the formula used for distribution, horizontal distribution, uh, already takes these things into impact. So the federal budget is very critical. And then again, you have to talk or speak about, are there input from uh, the provinces, a bit of political input in the distribution uh, decisions? Our finance and fiscal commission only advises. It goes then through a political process which the provinces participate in. And so there can be uh, a bit of alteration but you try to get an open and transparent process, but then the end result is provinces' uh, hands are fairly tied about what they can do and what 
policy initiatives they may take. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I think I'm, I may have to end the, the questions there, unless Johanna, Andrea, or Pablo, you have a burning answer to this question. Okay, uh, because uh, before I turn it over um, to Fernando Resende, I was wondering if Miguel Asensio, if you wanted to make some comments, are you? No? Okay. Um, uh, so let, let me just quickly sum up before I turn it over to Fernando. I, I think this was a, a great discussion today. I want to thank all of the panelists. Um, this was really interesting and, and I'm pleased that we talked more about local government today uh, th than we did yesterday. So, so that's terrific. Um, um, I think some of the themes were the same. We certainly talked about the importance of local autonomy. Uh, we talked about the Constitution, not only the division of powers in the Constitution, as we talked about yesterday, but the, the original powers of municipalities in the Constitution. Uh, we did talk a lot about the role of political parties, particularly in South Africa. Uh, but we also added the notion of political will from, from Mexico, uh, the desire for uniformity and how that affects intergovernmental cooperation in Germany. So some themes overlap with yesterday, but there's some new themes as well. In terms of the role of the, the different uh, levels or orders of government, federal, provincial, state, lander, and local, um, you know, we've seen some top down, some bottom up, and, and, a, and a mixture of the two. And we had a more fulsome discussion today of, of evaluation um, of, of intergovernmental relations, not so much the evaluation of the cooperation mechanisms, but of specific transfers to provinces or local governments, uh, but again, no systematic evaluation of cooperative agreements. I think somebody said we, we look at um, what didn't work and what the costs were of, of not having cooperation, uh, but less on the costs of having cooperation. So with that, uh, Fernando, I'll turn it over to you to close. Okay. Well, I, I agree with you in it, that uh, it was a very interesting and a very important discussion uh, today for our case in Brazil. Uh, yesterday, I just made a point that uh, there is no model that fits all regimes, all federal regimes or other multi-level regimes. But there are some common aspects that interfere in the work of this IGR in different countries. For instance, political interference, uh, uh, national priorities and local needs and so on. And particularly one question that to me is very important nowadays, we look with uh, more careful, we look more fair. It's, uh, Intergovernment relations and fiscal and, and federalism is an, an evolving issue. Things that move a long time. Uh, things, economic and social aspects in different countries change within a different context. And this, I think, it's a very important case in our days. Né? The world is went through a, a great what we could, I'm calling a great revolution in the, in the economics and also in the social area, given the impact of new technologies on the way production is organized around the world, organized and distributed in products and consumption are uh, moving in, in, the, in, in, in directions that we are not sure yet. Uh, what we are going in the nearby future. And this event today point out to one important question. There is a, a growing importance in a growing relation of municipalities with the national governments. And I wonder, I guess is the thing I would like to think more about in the next uh, days. Uh, I wonder if to what extent these changes that are happening in the world are 
let's say, uh, having some importance in this sense. Since the population, concentration of population in great metro areas seems to be a characteristic that is growing everywhere in the world. Uh, so, uh, and uh, to add to that, in the recent years, the last two years, the effect of pandemics, which uh, raised demand of uh, how the local governments would act, for instance, uh, to, uh, to help or to, to, to make more effective, uh, uh, to act more effective in the areas such as health, and education, which are mainly uh, responsibilities of the local governments and the municipalities. And um, the question of local governments that uh, took a very much importance in this uh, event today, I think it is very important for us. And I am thinking about organizing a discussion in Brazil uh, uh, to look at this particular aspect of federal regimes and intergovernmental cooperation. So uh, this was a stress the relation with uh, local governments and national governments was mentioned in cases of Colombia, in the case of South Africa, uh, in the case of uh, not Germany, because Germany is a very particular case of organizing, uh, that organizing the federations, the, the, the whole of the landers is, 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 is very much important and the landers might control uh, the local governance within their jurisdiction. But uh, you know, in different cases, in Mexico, uh, in Colombia, as I mentioned in South Africa, uh, this is happening uh, with uh, and growing so far as I could understand from this event. So, I finish here and I want to uh, thank you very much to, to all the participants in this uh, seminar, uh, to, especially to the organizers of this event and the Foreign Federation, the persons of Diana, Shevenova, and Lian, and also the extraordinary way Enid Slack moderated this discussion. So uh, thank you very much to all of you. And I hope we will see again, uh, not very much long in the time. <laughs> thank you very much, Fernando. Um, and uh, just uh, just final, final remarks uh, from, from my side. Um, just, I cannot uh, really um, uh, thank uh, more Enid for her uh, extraordinary moderation of the event. And of course, thank you for, uh, to all our panelists for uh, wonderful contributions, our participants for comments and uh, questions. And uh, we hope you all enjoyed the discussion and uh, found the uh, today webinar useful. Also, thanks to my colleagues at the forum, um, Liam, especially um, uh, our uh, interns and our students, our colleagues in IPEA, and uh, of course, also our interpreters. Uh, so, uh, yeah, no, there's no, not much more to say. So thank you all once again. And um, we just hope to, to see you uh, in the future in, in our uh, upcoming events. Uh, thank you again. Obrigado.